I'm Tiffany. I'm Sal. I'm Ben. And today we're actually going to be tackling a book that we've heard a lot of requests for. We're finally doing it. It's something we kind of knew we had to do someday. We weren't sure what the reception was going to be, nor how it would be taken on the couch, because it's a it's a I it's a well loved comic. I love this comic. This show tends to like kind of poke fun at and make fun of comics, but that's okay. Sometimes we can make fun of the things we love. Um, I'm of course talking about the Sandman Volume One, Preludes and Nocturnes, um, the very first volume in the ten volume series of Sandman. For me, a quintessential comic. If you're a comic fan, you have to read this book, especially if you're a DC fan, because there is a little more crossover into the in, from here into there and from there into here. Than you might expect. Technically Swamp Thing, Hellblazer, and even Sandman started as DC books. They didn't start as Vertigo because Vertigo didn't come around until 1993 when uh, essentially uh, DC was looking for a way to get around that pesky Comics Code Authority because they wanted to have these adult books and they didn't want to have to deal with worrying about making them for kids. So they turned to then editor Karen Berger. She had been working at DC um, since I guess the mid early 80s, maybe a little bit longer. Um, she's uh, partially responsible or often credited as like assisting in getting folk like Alan Moore, Grant yes. Morrison, Neil Gaiman like, to come on over and like start working in American comics. I can imagine that Alan Moore is the only one out of that team that would be like, ooh, I hate Karen Berger. Except, you know what, they had a really decent working relationship because she uh, at one point took over editing Swamp Thing with him. So they kind of worked together for a while. What prevents the Comics Code Authority from not then rating these books? Like, how does creating a new publishing label just mean that you're somehow exempt from it? Well, the Comics Code Authority only exists as a body. It doesn't exist anymore. But back then it existed as a body to govern children's books, basically. It was supposed to prevent kids from getting things that were not meant for them. And so if you make an adult publishing line, then the Comics Code has no jurisdiction because they're, they're already marketed for adults. These are books for adults. The Comics Code is just meant to keep adult books away from children mm -hmm. or to make sure that children's books are not being like corrupting. What's interesting is, yes, while the Comics Code Authority was silly and just really caused a lot of people having to trip over themselves to try to get a book out. Literally, Marvel just went like, oh, we're just not going to use it anymore. Yeah. One day. And that was it. And that was it. But like, but from it, we did get Vertigo. And from Vertigo, we got a lot of amazing books, including this, including the saga of Swamp Thing and just Swamp Thing in general, Hellblazer, and then inevitably books like Preacher. Yeah. You know Ooh. what I mean? So like, Vertigo coming out of this, I think, is one of the best things that came from the Comics Code Authority. <laughs> well, honestly, like, I find that uh, like true and really, really like celebrated creativity comes from adversity and struggle. Mm -hmm. And the Comics Code Authority, while stupid, was definitely serving a purpose and caused a lot of creative gymnastics for my favorite uh, movers and shakers in comics. Right. Uh, one last note before we, we be in this. Um, Neil Gaiman initially, when writing comics, was not commercially successful no nope. <laughs> critically people liked him but commercially not so much he wrote miniseries essentially okay. um, did they become miniseries I mean, it was more like no, he was writing a series and then no he because he's, and then they kicked it's always, he's always says that this was his first monthly and so um found that this very first volume he calls awkward because it was the first monthly he ever did and so he's like i don't even know how i'm gonna end it uh-oh <laughs> So um, it's, it's interesting to see, and I, and I do know what he means. Definitely, you see, you feel him hit his stride. This is a phenomenal book out of the gate. I gotta right. say, this is a great book. It really sets up the, the universe. If you know anything about Neil Gaiman, you know that he knows how to set up a universe. You know he knows how to craft a world, and yeah. that is what he does here. But he does it while keeping the DC universe in mind, hmm. which is, I think, an incredible feat. Um, but he wanted to get more into comics. He wanted to write a Sandman book. It wasn't this, because this did not exist. Right, because he had no idea what he this was. He wanted to write the, like, Garrett uh, Sanford uh, Sandman, essentially, from, like, back in the day. Jack Kirby. Oh, the, the, the red and yellow guy? Oh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Him, you know, brute glob, the whole thing, right? He yeah. wants to write that. He's thinking about pitching it, right? A little while later, he gets a call from Karen Berger. She's like, I want you to do a Sandman book. And he's like... Coincidentally? Right, and he's like, yeah, okay, that sounds great. Oh, wait, what's the catch? And she's like... Well, I know there's a catch. There's yeah. always a catch. Because you're the devil. <laughs> I think she's like, here's the thing. Sandman book, want you to do it. Going to be a monthly. You can't use any of our other Sandman because there's also Wesley Dodd Sandman. Yeah, what, what about the guy with the gas mask? That's Wesley Dodd. Because that's the one that like I was always familiar with. And I remember seeing, like, I remember hearing as a kid yes. growing up that like this Sandman. Yes. Gravatus. Oh, and right. then I would like find old, like really old like Sandman comics of this dude who looked like a shadow. But yes. With, it, 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 he looks like Green Hornet but with it wearing a gas yeah, mask. Yeah, yeah. That's horrifying. You were probably finding the Sandman mystery theater. Yes. And I, and um, I remember being like, I don't care about that. Sandman is like, all right, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to just, I'll just make my own Sandman. Okay, cool. He yeah. sits down. He had this initial image 
of a man, young, pale, and naked, imprisoned in a tiny cell, waiting until his captor passed away, deathly thin, with long, dark hair and strange eyes. And from that, he crafts 75 issues of Sandman yeah. and tells a phenomenal story. And somehow manages to turn the comic book industry on its ear. One other thing. He does something that no one has ever really done at this point. This is a monthly series. It's an ongoing, right? He, throughout his, like, about the midway point, right? Things are going well. He starts to put into interviews, like, I really hope this series, they don't continue it after I leave. I really hope they don't continue it after I leave. I really <laughs> hope they don't continue it after I leave. Which is unheard of. A, a writer leaves, and you then, just get a new writer. Right, it's, then, like, it's just comics. That's right? how it works. Yeah, but this is my story. Yeah. But by the end, they all agreed. They couldn't imagine the series going on without him. And so when he left at issue 75, the series was over. So this is not a story that supposedly had a beginning, middle, and end. This was supposed to be a monthly ongoing. He told his story, and then they stopped. Right. They were, and they, then he was like, my reverse psychology didn't work! Damn it! <laughs> I thought it was we're like, supposed yeah. to be on Sandman 600 by now! No. Um, so, let's get into it. Please. Um, first of all, two books here, right? You guys can technically kind of pass this one around. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to use this one. This is the recolor. It's is it fine. the same book? It is the exact same book. The slightly different thickness just because of the paperweight. This is the recolored version of it. This is the original colored version of it. Yeah. Um, they're, they're both fine. Whichever one you get, this is easier to pick up than this. This isn't bad. It's not bad. It's just there are some panels. Yeah, I prefer original colors. The recolor was actually someone who did work on this book at one point. Oh. So, like, it is someone who had, like, connection to it. So, it totally. But then like, you have, like, the works. killing joke. Yeah, here's the thing. Technology changed, so the coloring changed. Yeah. Um, but they never changed the covers, which are, like, painstakingly it's, created yeah, in no. ways you couldn't even imagine. If you get a chance, look it up. But our story begins in, in the year 1916, uh, as all great stories do, <laughs> um, with Dr. Hathaway arriving at the home of Roderick Burgess with a book in hand. And in the middle of World War II. It's actually in the middle of World War One. I'm sorry, War. Um, sorry. and Doctor Hathaway is there because his son actually died in World War One, and he's heard rumblings that Roderick Burgess is attempting to conquer death and can do so with the book that he has because um, Doctor Hathaway is a museum curator and has access to certain things. Right. So he brings him the book and he's like, "My kid's dead. Help me out." He's like, "Dude, I got you. I've got a book for that." By I've the done way, all this shit. as a kid, I I grew up on this kind of stuff, like. That if you go deeper and into the darker place of the library, you'll find, like, ancient tomes that will yeah. be, like, you know, portals to death and hell and stuff. Yes. Never found a single one. I would just find more boring encyclopedias. Well, yeah. to be fair... Encyclopedias. Yeah. And, like, notations of things. Mm -hmm. well, he brings him the Magdalene Grimoire. And what does that mean? Uh, it's a book. It's a book that's created here. Okay. Essentially, it's a magic tome. Essentially, which it's a grimoire, man. Come on. It'll I later. Don't know what that means. It'll later be used in the DC universe by a character. I think his name's Stanley Dover. Okay. He summons the beast with no name. Yes. That's what he uses. Was that in? That was in Green Arrow Quiver. Yeah. Hey! That's the book that he uses. No it's from way. Here, because that, no Stanley way. Dover attends a party that's thrown later on by a character and in, takes the book. In in the present or in nineteen sixteen. In nineteen seventy. Oh, that's cool. Right? I wasn't there for Quiver. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should check it out. It's the link above your head. <laughs> but stay here with us for right now. Watch it later. <sighs> He's going to click the link and disappear. So, he takes the book. He performs a um, a, a magical ceremony of sorts. He's got all kinds of... Uh, yeah, kind of. I mean, it's very much a spell. Right. He's got all these parts, and there's incantations, and there's people in robes. We got and the components. Yeah, we got the whole nine he got yards. A, he, got, he had to rope in people, and yeah. be like, you have to wear these robes. There's, sorry. there's feathers and blood and all that stuff. He's, oh. he's got a little organization going. Oh, there, I see. Right? Like, he's, he's, he's well, got... Then he was like, Jenkins, I need you to come over. And put on this robe! Right, exactly. That's 1916, you know, whatever. That's fair. Um, and he's essentially looking to conquer death. And by conquer death, I mean capture death. And then... Uh, and, and then capture it in his in sack! sack. <laughs> like a soldier in death and the storyteller. No, he uh. wants to capture it in a dome. And his... Here's what's so funny. Because Dr. Hathaway thinks, like, oh, he'll help me out or he'll do whatever. Right. And, like, Roger's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just really want immortality. Oh. So... So we were already not on the same page. But he doesn't care. He just wanted the book. And he got the book. And he captures something, in fact. Oh, so it works. It does work. And, and a being arrives wearing a crazy mask and a dark cloak, essentially, holding an amulet and a, a bag. Okay. Because he's wearing a gas mask. This is an it's homage not, well, to the old Sandman. Well, yeah. Trust me. Gaiman's gonna... 
This man just rope just, it all together. Just all together. Are you sure it's not like the Voyager or whatever it is, the explorer in Prometheus? Oh yes, the uh, the engineer. The, the engineers, engineer. the space yeah. jockeys. Because it looks a lot like that mask. It really I does know, right? actually. They recognize that it's not death. They don't know what it is. But it's not death. Yeah, none of these visuals indicate death to me. Right? <laughs> He's not carrying a giant scythe or made of skeletons. I mean, I like the drapery, well, but uh, right. the, but a bag, little bag. So they take all of his stuff and That's they a sack. and they and they take off his clothing and they make him naked. Aww. And they keep him. <laughs> and they draw on him. <laughs> Loser. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and then they boys. haze him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. But so the, so this is the visual that Gaiman had in his mind. This well, actually, the visual will come a little later on. But okay. yes, it's very similar to. So that. they're like, "You're not death, screw you!" And they take all this shit. And they take and all this shit, and they, and they put him in a dome. Okay. And then Roger comes to visit him and says, "Like, hey, look, here's the thing. I'm not letting you out until you give me the secrets of immortality. And once you do, you're free to go." Uh huh. Is it like a glass dome? Yeah. Are there holes so he can breathe? Well, well he's from like another realm. Here's what we will soon discover. Oh, okay. Because Roderick's pretty sure he might have figured out who it is. And his son Alex later on will confirm that when he's like, hey, dad, I figured it out. And he shows him this book and there's a there's a picture of a being that looks very much like the one that they, they caught. And he's Dream of the Endless. I'm going to try to keep this book within just the context of this volume. Right, you don't want to give away too much I of really like volume don't. three. But even in listing them, I will have given something away, but here I go anyway. <laughs> so we have, I know the three eldest, but I, the rest of them I'm like, I don't know. So we have Destiny, Death, Dream, Desire, Delirium, and Destruction. And Derp. <laughs> well, only if you join them. A lot of teams. <laughs> <laughs> I'm familiar with Death. Yes, death is um because I've seen her appear in no numerous different Oh, with versions. the Ankh tattoo. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's death. Death is um well, well actually we'll meet her in this. Oh good. Um so we'll get to talk about her when we get there. Um interestingly enough, we will also um kind of meet Destiny for a little bit. Oh really? Destiny's not a Neil Gaiman creation. Destiny's a creation of DC. He was part of a book, I think it's called like um Tales of Mystery or something like that. They wanted to do this horror like anthology book kind of thing where they, they had him and characters named Cain and Abel and Eve all tell little stories. Pre-Vertigo? Yes. Mm -hmm. Like way back in the day, like the 70s. Yeah. And they phased Destiny out because they're like, the this other characters, weird. well, they made fun of him and they were like, you're, you're boring. So they phased him out and like Cain, and Abel, and Eve became the main hosts of the okay. book. And that was kind of it. And then Gaiman was like, he's an endless. He's mm -hmm. Destiny. Oh, cool. So now he's an endless. So already he's like, yeah, Karen, I'm, I'm not going to do anything from your books. By the way, really quick aside. Yeah. About apropos death, because it just reminded me, because I was like, oh yeah, with the Ankh tattoo. And I'm like, and she's like this cute, like, goth chick. Then I remembered my Max mm -hmm. from Image that Sam Keith wrote and created and yes. drew. Uh, there's a scene in the Max where we meet, like, a teenage girl. And she's, like, kind of goth. Uh -huh. But mostly because, like, she's de she's depressed and miserable. She's yeah. not, like, goth. She's just unhappy. Mm -hmm. And she says, I know what death looks like. Death is disgusting and terrible and, like, sad and frustrating. Not some cute chick. And it just occurred to me that Keith the drew some of this. Yes. And maybe there's some, like, bad blood between him and Gaiman. There shouldn't be. Because by issue five, Sam Keith realized he couldn't keep up with the work. He That's couldn't right. do the monthly, and he left. And the inker takes over as the artist. Oh, shit. And they get a new artist in there. And personally, I like Mike Dringenberg mm -hmm. takes over. I love his art. I was going to say, does Dringenberg hold up to I, Keith? He's better than Keith. And then inevitably, it, it, over time, Dringenberg can't keep up with the, the art either. <laughs> so like a year or so into it, he's... So having a problem. Hang Neil on. Gaiman is sucking the life out of his artists Just to write this book. <laughs> well, these guys kind of came together and they really never worked on monthlies before. So right. they were like, I don't know what we're doing. Yeah, Gaiman's like, I've never written on the They were like, well, I've never drawn a monthly before. Well, let's do it. And yeah, then it just doesn't work pretty out. much. So but, they would have been perfect for Image because nobody put out a book on time. Right? right, but from this, from this whole kind of clusterfuck going on, mm -hmm. Gaiman starts to get like these fill-in artists and from that he realizes, you know what's really cool? That! Getting an artist that fits my story. Right. And so there's a point where the artist is changing all the time. Right. And it's like, oh, no, no, we're doing this on purpose. And it's they are. Yeah, but it's like the it, they it didn't, it didn't originally. It looks, okay. it looks like a little bit of brilliance, but it's also more like... Yeah. Well, they stumbled upon it. He was yeah. like, man, this guy worked really well on this issue. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> You're fired. So while they have Dream, the world starts to experiencing this sleeping sickness. 
Right, because there's the, the the god of dream, I guess, is no longer there to like make people experience. Kind is of, that what he does, Morpheus? Like he makes you dream. He he creates dreams, and he can like morph the dream realm, and like he you'll see him later on create nightmares. Like he does all kinds. So there's of a things. place you go when it's you dream. It's called the dreaming. Ah. He exists in the realm of the dreaming, and there are many characters there, and many people uh, or many in, like entities that are created there. And in fact, sometimes if someone dies, their spirit can go to the dreaming and live out there. Why would of they their do that? Life. Um, there's a character from um, Swamp Thing named Matthew who dies and then goes to the Dreaming as a crow because he can just live there. So that he but can be like, there and interact yeah. with people's dreams. Well, it, but like he's, is that what he does? Is it like so he can of, like the keyhole he reach actually, other people? He actually works with Morpheus. He's like he oh kind of like a personal assistant. Okay. <laughs> Well, that's fun. Yeah, and inevitably, like, some other stuff happens. I don't want to ruin anything. Actually, yeah. I, I, yeah. Um, Matthew, take a note. Ah! God, you suck. He talks, right? <laughs> he's like, a he, Oh, he talks. He has, like, a voice, and he knows who he is, and, like, you know what I mean? Like, he's just like, yeah, this is cool. Yeah. Never yeah. more! Knock it off. I know um, you can speak. <laughs> but Stop doing this bit. And here's something that you need to recognize. If you're reading this book, and, like... You have no context for anything that's happening? No. If you're reading this book, <laughs> and, like, you're like, oh, there's this page rolling on where we meet these four characters, and, like, you're like, what the hell? Trust me, at the very least, one of them will be useful later on. Okay. Because Gaiman does that. He puts these seeds in, and then later on, you're totally rewarded for remembering things. Yeah, because I remember <laughs> reading the first huh. issue or so, and I was like, who are all these people? Well, I don't care. Where's Batman? Because, Pass! Well, because at the end of the day, Sam ends up at like a, like a kind of semi-dysfunctional family, uh, a, a kind of crappy dream god who like is like really petty and angry and rage-filled. <laughs> oh, and, cool. And humanity. Oh right, and the uh, the just that small concept exactly of our shared existence. So we meet, Jesus, we meet these three people. Um, the first chick, Ellie, is like she falls asleep and then like will wake up like every couple of years, and like this goes on for decades. People are have suffer from the sleeping sickness for decades. But not like everybody, just certain people. Some people do. Are they all uh, connected sleeping sickness in some way? where they fall asleep and don't no. wake up? Some of them do, and some of them never go back to sleep. Okay, do they I still wasn't go crazy sure exactly though? what sleeping sickness huh? meant. Do they still go crazy? Oh yeah. They have a kid here. Um, his name is um, Bustamante, Daniel Bustamante. He's one of the people who's like in this waking, like he's awake but he's asleep. It's like Gandalf. Oh yeah, like and when like he's sleeping just gets and his eyes are work. open anyway. Yeah, but like he kind of oh. has a life for a while, but then eventually he loses his family and he ends up homeless, and then like it's a nightmare, right? right. The the young girl who is asleep and then wakes up every once in a while, like still thinks whenever she wakes up that she's a child because oh. even though she's an old like because she missed all these she years. missed her childhood, that and sucks. so she wakes up and she thinks. And she's like in like a home somewhere. Oh, do we a... like do we see scenes where she's like, "Where's my mom?" And the like, mom died. Yes. Ugh. Um, we, I mean, like that's great. We it's, have that's good storytelling. But she's on the meal. We have a kid who like is in World War One, and he lied about his age. He's only fourteen. He lied to get into the army, and he's mm. going to go up over the wall. We inevitably see him, and that like he can never go back to sleep because of a the war and b because of like dream being gone. Yeah. And so he ends up killing himself at the age of sixteen. Aww. We meet um, Unity Kincaid, who is a young girl as well, who suffers from the sleeping sickness. She goes to sleep. She'll occasionally wake up. Um, her parents are very wealthy, so like they try to keep her in comfort or whatever. Mm -hmm. At one point during her sleep, someone comes in. They rape her. She has a child, Ugh. and they take it away, and they make it disappear. The parents die. That No one takes care of her, so they put her in a nursing home. Aww. Wait, the child doesn't become, like, one of the weird characters because it's affected by the sleeping sickness? <laughs> right? Like... That sounds about right. No, but I and I can't give anything away about that, but there is something about that character. There, okay. The, the child okay. character. But it's not that. Wow. Fair enough. The game sure planted a seed there. Ugh. This is still in DC. This so this is, is happening crazy. while, like, Superman is, like, stopping This Mongol is 1989. And... Oh, okay. So it's post-crisis. So yes. Superman and Batman have met, and they're, they're, they're fighting magpie and right. stuff. Right. And, and people can't sleep. And people can't sleep. So, essentially, like, inevitably... Uh, hey, Rod... there's my Sandman. Yes. Okay. That's a, that's a really good catch. Wesley Dodd is called to action because he, is, he has these recurring dreams about a man in a mask. Because the universe is trying to fill a gap. Oh, like we're missing a sandman. We're missing a sandman. And he, when he becomes the sandman, the dreams stop. Oh. So he fulfills a role. Okay. It's I, I love that. But like, he, I assume he plays no further role in the rest of this book. Not in this book, no. I see. Um, so um, well, that's cool. over time, like, Roderick becomes more and more desperate uh, because he's coming to the end of his life. Oh, wait, but that was in 1916. So it's, it's been happening since 1916. Yeah, until... we see decades going and going and yeah, going. Yeah, yeah. Um, we also see Roderick's right-hand man, um, Ruthven Sykes. Mm -hmm. Nothing. 
Uh, Sykes, uh, Oliver Me- Twist? Mechanical arm. Oh, yeah, Mr. Sykes. <laughs> yeah, he had the mechanical arm. He um, killed Richard Kimball's wife. <laughs> I thought Richard Kimball killed his wife. Sykes runs away with Roderick's mistress. Oh, cool. And Roderick has a real problem with that. And he's yeah. Gonna, and he's going to use magic to get him, but he knows that. Sykes is like, I know he's going to do that. <laughs> so what he did was he stole Dream's helmet, Dream's amulet, or his, like, dream stone, and the bag, along with a whole bunch of money. He took all the dream He like, took it all. He's like, screw you. And he leaves. I'm out of here. And then he trades the helmet to a demon for a protective talisman. Oh. Inevitably, the mistress, like, some years later, leaves him, takes the talisman and a bunch of the artifacts, and she leaves. And then his head explodes. There, there's a spell cast upon him that's like, whenever you're not protected, your head will explode. Yeah. Right. So he gets them finally. But then okay, it's not worth it, though, because he had to kill a cat to do it. Well. That's pretty sad. I know. I, well, Roger like, Burgess is, is a bastard, and eventually he dies in 1947, never having gained the knowledge from mortality. No, he just... So, is there a scene where he's like, damn you, Morpheus! Yeah, he gets more and more angry to the point where he's just like a pitiful... He's just a raving sad... He, yeah, he's just a sad old man. And, and Morpheus dies. is still stuck in the dome. He's still stuck in the dome. <laughs> He can't go. He is, can't is, leave. It's is magic. Is he really heavy? Okay. It's yeah. magic. He's protected by like magical ta- like things. And also, he derives power from those. And as we would find out later on in Overture, he was in a battle prior to this. That's the only reason... That's why he's weakened? Roderick was able to capture anybody was because he was incredibly weakened when he got there. Gotcha. Okay. Otherwise, he would have kicked some ass. Or he would have he never caught anybody. He right. would have done nothing. Do we oh. find out what fight he was in? In Overture. Oh. If you read that. Wow, so you had to wait like 20 years to find out what the hell Morpheus is up to? years. Screw that. <laughs> 25 years. <laughs> so, um, so you'd think if you were a Roderick's kid, you'd be like, I'm going to let this. I'd be like, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm really sorry. Lift. I-, I feel like Morpheus wouldn't feel bad for me. I feel like he'd still fuck well, you over. Well, don't worry. Alex doesn't give him a chance to even think that because oh, he's good. like, hey, man, same deal. You right. give me the secret immortality, I'll Morpheus let you like, out. So far, I haven't noticed a damn change. And Morpheus... Morpheus just looking at him like, see what happened to your dad? And this is yeah. one of the first times we see him. Just, no. <laughs> no. No, I'm not going to do it. We see time progress once again. Like, during the 60s, uh, Alex gets into the whole, like, being, like, a guru kind of thing. And, like, having people come to him and, like, pay him money to do something about tantric sex and all that stuff, right? Oh, fun. And also, watch this guy I captured. No! <laughs> Look at this naked What's bobino. What's funny is, like, everyone who's ever guarded Morpheus, they have to either sustain themselves on coffee... Or, like, they only have, like, short shifts. They can never sleep there because they're concerned. That he'll invade their Use, dreams. He'll, he'll be powered by that. Oh. So in the 60s, he's like, no one can do psychedelic drugs in my house. <laughs> but that's all we do in the 60s! <laughs> I am tripping balls right now! Also during this time, Alex has a companion by the name of Paul. A companion. Oh, okay. yes. Uh, in the traditional sense. He's both, a, he's both a personal assistant and also... Boyfriend. Yes. Inevitably, like, you just kind of see them living their lives, and, like, Morpheus is waiting. He's, he knows it's coming soon. He knows he's oh, going to get it. His, like... He can feel it. Because now at this point, Alex is near the end of his life. Oh. We're in the 80s at this point. Like, we've gone through this time. Or the present. Since yeah, the it's, book is it's like, I believe it's 1988. Okay. So Morpheus has been there from 1916 to 1988. Just in a dome. Yeah, just sitting there. So what happens is one of the guys who's guarding him dozes off. And this time, because Roderick's wheelchair distorted the ring of magic that was around him, mm-hmm. Morpheus can go into his dream, even for a moment. He's dreaming about the beach, and he takes some sand with him. Oh. And then he plays possum and pretends he's dead. And a bunch of people come down, and they're like, oh, crap, that's never happened. Yeah, he it's never fell over. In 70 years, he's never just fallen the fuck over. Yeah, he just sits there. We killed him. Well, yeah. Yeah, you had him in a dome. Right, so they open it up, and he... Bursts out and immediately puts them all to sleep with the sand he had. He doesn't pee on them? <laughs> no. And then he immediately... I've been waiting to do this for seven decades! Golden shower! Oh. Oh. Hope you're all on LSD! No. <laughs> no, instead what he does... What sand? He invades their dreams. And like he starts hopping from dream to dream to dream. Like to get out of the house? Well, he's also collecting food because like I haven't eaten in 70 years. That's funny. And so he starts to eat. And what if he... he's like... Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As he eats, he gains a little bit more power. From that, he can then, like, clothe himself, and then he's ready to go face Alex. Also, simultaneously around the world, people are waking up. Right. And so we see all the sad stories occur, and, like, Unity Kincaid, remember, she had a baby. Yeah. And, like, the young girl, like, you know, is in, like, this Alice in Wonderland state because she's still a child. Granted, Bustamante, like, is like, I'm finally getting my life back together. Right. So, like, he's like, okay, I'm going to do this. Goes and visits Alex in his dream, 
puts him back to when he was a kid, essentially. Mm -hmm. And then, like, Alex immediately folds. He's just like, I'm so sorry. It was really my dad's fault. He did this. Not me. Come on, man. Give me a break. And he's like, no. 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 You were a dick, too. Right. You had the chance to lift the glass. What'd you do? Those are the two things he said to him. Yeah. (laughs) It's just no. Yeah. No, he goes into a whole thing. Oh, he's like... he's Yeah, he dresses him down. He dresses him completely down. And then he's just like, you stole everything from me, and now I have to go get them back. Right, I have to go get my But gift. not before I give you a little gift. No, oh, no. And it's the gift of the eternal waking. Okay. Which is not what you think it is. I would assume it's just that he can't fall asleep. No, he's asleep. And in his nightmares, he wakes up from a nightmare only to be in another nightmare. <laughs> forever. Oh, so he's in hell. Right, cool. <laughs> dream hell. So now Dream returns to the dreaming where we run into Cain and Abel, which of course I've established that they come from another book. Yes. Now in that other book, they, they are they still were the said, brothers from the Bible. In the other book, the original book said no, but in this, they indicate yes. Okay. And then we often seen Cain killing Abel. Just they're, he, He's perpetually killing him. He just him. can't help himself. Like he gives him a gift and it's going to explode. Like he can't help himself and right. Abel always falls for it. That's kind of funny. <laughs> And each time he's just like, no. So he returns to it. They, they help him to essentially like recover. And then he decides he needs to return home. And in doing so, he discovers that um, his home is destroyed. And we find Lucian, who's another character from that same, yeah. from earlier books. Um, and he's the keeper of the library of dreams. And he let the whole place fall apart? Well, no, there was nothing he could do without dreaming. Without dream there, uh, it began to unravel. I see. A library of dreams meaning like all the dreams were like recorded? recorded? Well, there's like, we do, we, we do run into the library later on. And one of the fun things that's in the library are books that were never finished or dreamt up by authors. Oh. So there's like a book by Tolkien in there. Oh, that's like fine. there's a book by um i think there's a lewis carroll one in there maybe i'm not sure that um, makes sense. it's just this is like a lot of just fun titles of, of books that yeah. like you can never have <laughs> you can't have because they didn't I'm finish sorry. them and they were just in their mind exactly yeah. um but they have them there right and they can read the them exactly um no fair <laughs> so basically dreams like oh man i gotta i gotta rebuild everything no does he just can he, if he gets more powerful he can reconstitute the dream exactly like the, the yes that's exactly it but he needs his three items right oh, okay. and so what he does is he needs to conjure um some help and so what he does is he uses the dreams of, of people who are dreaming currently to find very specific totems and in doing so summons the hecate Oh. Or the Furies, or the Kindly Ones, or whatever they want to be called at that time, because of the fact that they change all the time. Like throughout this book? They change what they look like, they change what they want to call themselves. Do any of them ever look like the Furies uh, from Apocalypse? No. That's too bad. <laughs> Do they ever look like the Witches in Macbeth? Uh, Kind of, occasionally. He's allowed to ask three questions, so to each one of them he asks a question, like, where is my sleep pouch? Where is my, my helmet? Yeah, where's my helmet? And, and where's my helmet? And where's my dreamstone? Yeah. And so they give him a lead. Man, thank God he didn't need four things. Right? <laughs> well, he just had to pick and choose. Yeah. <laughs> what do I not really need? Um, and so, like, we get a bunch of leads as to where they are, and so he has to go in and find them. Okay. And this is, the, like, one of the first times we're going to see some characters you might actually know, including John Constantine. Oh, and you see... What? Green Lantern and, and Batman. Batman. Hey, there's your Batman! Hey! I guarantee that's the one panel I will get of Batman. In this book? Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, By but, the way, but he's yeah, there. The... He moonlighted. It's true. Batman On the cover, they can say, so... starring Batman. Yeah. <laughs> so, so special guest appearance. So we're in the DC universe and Dream's like, I gotta go through the, I gotta go through the I gotta go, damn world. I gotta go deal with this now. And so okay, Batman cool. and Green Lantern were like shaking somebody down and they had like an, the amulet or something. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll get into that. Trust oh, really? Me, that's gonna be, we're going, we're gonna talk all about that when we when we get to that. First, we're gonna deal with the pouch. That's his first stop. He's like, that's the easiest one. That's the pouch one. of sand? Yeah, I'm gonna no, go get that. He's still sand from a dream. Couldn't he just use any sand? He needs that one in particular because it's like endless. Like, it's special. Like, I that see. pouch, like, never ends. It has part of his power. He needs it. Yeah. Okay. Rather than going into a dream and being like, I gotta keep going into dreams for Sam. Yeah, That's true. exactly. You, so, know, you know how annoying that is? <laughs> <laughs> how, you know how many people are dreaming about beaches? Not as many as you think. Here's well, the thing. I have a cell phone on me. I can just use it every time I want to look at the internet. I don't have to go to my computer each time. Right? Yeah. So, so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> so we meet... Constantine. Yay. Because John Constantine is the last person who knew where the pouch was. So Dream shows up and like, it's funny because like he keeps hearing things that are going to tell him. Like he runs into uh, another Constantine character, uh, Mad Hetty or mm-hmm. Hetty, Hetty. Um, and um, she warns him that Dream is back and he's like, I don't care. You're making up fairy stories. Oh, he doesn't know. Like he doesn't know. Oh. He's just like, I don't care. But then like throughout the day he hears like, you know, the song Sandman playing and stuff like he's that. Like, no, and that's no, when no. at the door, of course, Morpheus shows up. He's like, hey, 
He pisses himself. No, he tries to make a little joke at him. Oh, okay. And then, like, like... I have no fucking time for jokes. Yeah, he's just like, I need my thing. He's like, okay, well... Well, here it is. Well, he doesn't have it. He's like, I think my friend Chaz has it in his, like, essentially, like, storage area. Oh. Chaz Kramer? <laughs> you big Chaz fan? <laughs> Only from the movie. Okay. <laughs> yes, no, no. <laughs> You mean Con- fucking Shia LaBeouf? Yeah. yeah! That's a character for Constantine. God he is someone it. who drives around. I know, I'm just saying. Like, But he remembers that Ch- Chaz has like a kind of storage area for a lot of his stuff. So he goes there, and he starts going through a bunch of things, and he realizes when he sees a photograph, he's like, crap, I know who has your, your pouch. Oh. It's an old girlfriend of his by the name of Rachel. And, uh, Where's Rachel, though? Well, she's having a problem. Because the fact is... She snorted all the time. She had, well, she always <laughs> had interest in the pouch, and she uses it as a drug. Oh, Jesus! <laughs> And like, so she does snort it. Damn it! But like, she's used it so much that the house is now infected with dream. Uh, I see. And like, a guy goes to break in, and, and he like, just falls into like a nightmare. Like, well, he ends up. He sees a dream, and then inevitably, when they get there, like, first of all, dreams like you can't go in. It's real bad. Right. And Constantine's like, I'll do it anyway. I'm gonna go anyway. It's cool. Chaz, stay out here, and you can always leave. It, it's totally fine. Or if he's like, No, no, this is real bad. Yeah, you don't yeah. get it. So they find the yeah, guy. Yeah, I've never done this. <laughs> He, they find the guy on the floor and like Constantine's like what's wrong with him he's like they're like the dreams are eating him ah and now is it like Toontown and there's like all these like cute little characters hopping around not, or like... not even a little bit like they open a door Constantine flips on a light switch and there's like goo on the wall <laughs> and in doing so like it tumbles Constantine literally into like a nightmare where he is falling uh-huh. oh thank god I was concerned that would be a wet dream no and then Constantine's like it's just a dream it's just a dream he's like he's like it's never just a dream right it's all, like <laughs> yeah Huh. I take that as a really big insult. Yeah, you I am fuck. just exactly. the guy. Oh, are you just doing magic? Oh, it's just magic. Are you just alive, prick? <laughs> so then, you see the walls here? Yeah. Yeah, they're Ugh. like, he's like, what is this? He's like, oh, it's a human body. Probably what's left of her father. Oh. And they're like, and Constantine's like, it's still alive. He's like, yep. Yeah. Oh, it's a dream. That's horrifying. Well, it's really him. Too. That's like Lovecraftian horror right there. Oh, yeah. Like a living body on yep. a wall. No. So when they find Rachel, she is a disaster. Yeah. Like, she is, like, falling apart. Her skin's peeling off. Like, it's just, she is not good. Yeah. And the pouch is there, and Morpheus grabs it, and he's like, <laughs> Bye! Okay, pretty much. He's like, okay, good, bye. I'm gonna go. And yeah. Constantine's like, you are not gonna leave here like this. Yeah. And he's like, but she's dying. You and understand. not only that, she deserves it. Well, right. it's not really her fault. Fault, like it became a drug. Like she became addicted to needing to be dreaming. Well, at and all also times. like Constantine has no responsibility or regard for the things that he uses. So he's like, yeah, yeah, just I no. Look. She stole it, and he didn't even realize it was oh, gone. All right. And so like when he realized, he was like, oh, but I don't think he understood the ramifications. No. But like he yeah. knew it wasn't good. But Constantine feels bad. Yeah, but Morpheus is and like, I guess no, no. And he's just, he's just like, I loved her at one point. Like she was like my girl, oh. and I need you to do something for her. So Morpheus makes him leave, mm-hmm. and what he does is he gives her like one last happy dream, and then she dies. Okay. And the dream is of her and Constantine together, Aww. like having a nice time, and it's like so sweet. Yeah. And like John's like, "What'd you do?" And he's like, "I gave her a happy." I ending. killed her. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I gave her happy. Uh, I made gave her, her happy ending. ending. Exactly. Yeah, I gave her a happy ending, and she's Aww. totally like, "It's fine. Don't worry." Um, because don't forget too, Morpheus knows that his sister is coming. Of death. Yeah. Yeah. Like, she'll take care of her. Don't worry. It's totally cool. Usually death shows up, like, before they die. Well, sometimes. Now, that's also interesting. You brought up death and the fact that, like, they're siblings. Um, They're all siblings. Oh, yeah, that's right. But, like, (laughs) is death looking for him? Okay. No. Right? No one was looking for him. Is it because he's a dick? There's only one person who knew he was there, and it's someone who couldn't say anything. Why? Because it's destiny. Destiny can never oh, interfere. Right. But he knew it was happening. Right. And okay. He, and there's a moment where he like he's he's looking in his book because his book contains all past, present, and future. Mm-hmm. And like he has a moment where he's afraid to turn the page. And it's awesome <laughs> because a lot of this whole story is about the power of story, yeah. and not like in an M. Night Shyamalan authors are great and like they're the greatest thing ever, mm-hmm. but like in a way of like. Don't let stories go. They're really important and yeah. we should all enjoy them and like take part in them to right. some degree. And not in a Grant Morrison story where it's like you're in a story right now and actually someone's literally reading you at this time. No, there is a meta moment way later on at the end. Yeah. Um, they were they were all doing that back yeah, then. Yeah, I believe it. By the way, and each one was cool. Yeah, I totally <laughs> believe that. One day we'll do Animal Man. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do that. This won't happen. I'm a little scared. But um, then be. Constantine, like, John asks 
Morpheus for more favor mm-hmm. and it's to help him to forget the nightmares from Newcastle, which was like an arc that Constantine had oh, cool. earlier. Um, and it's just that there was some fallout from that and he wants them gone. And Dream's like, nah, bye. No, Dream's like, yeah, <laughs> done. And then oh, cool. and Constantine hilariously sings Mr. Sandman. Oh, After because Dream he's been hearing it all day. Right. Gotta get it the hell out of my head. <laughs> so the next item that Dream has to get is his helmet, which is in hell. I thought he was eating it like a bowl of cornflakes for a second. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> It's like, yeah, got oh, my sand. Oh. Exactly. I don't, it's like when you get something back that you lost for a long time, you don't even know what to do with it well, when no. you get it. So, so you just, just stick it. it in your mouth. He mentions that like he keeps playing with it. Like he can't every time he, he reaches in, he's just like, it's still there. Okay. Right, like, he right. can't help but like play with it once again. That's he's cool. playing with his sack all the time. His sand! The sand in the sack! <laughs> so he's gotta go to hell, you say? He has to go to hell. Hell is a place. Right. Hell you is can a go. You can go there. And he well, has like the to dream go there. Then. Exactly. And it's where the demon is that has his helmet. He wants it back because mm-hmm. he needs it back. So he goes there and like he's given a really hard time by a demon who's at the front gate. And like like the demon's like, yeah, but you don't like I don't know who you are. And he's like, I am I'm Morpheus of the Dreaming. Like yeah. I am my like a monarch in my own right. And he's just like, yeah, but where's your crown, clown? And he just gives him a really hard time up, right. up until another demon shows up and says like, I'm gonna deal with this. Yeah, I'm good. And that demon, of course, is Etrigan. <laughs> Yay! So Etrigan shows up and he's just like, come on. I'll take you to I'll take you to uh, to Dis, which is the city in hell. Okay. Um, where where Lucifer's um, palace is essentially. Right. So they they go on their merry way. They go through the suicide forest, like we merry see. way. Yeah, well they're happy. Well, Dream is something to fear, and Etrigan's a demon. Dream has everything to fear here. Why? Because he is not powerful at this point, and and he knows. Was he still gaining his power, or? Well, he only has the the sand. He needs right, the other he two needs things. His other two and even still, there's an analogy later on in in another book in which he mentions that like Lucifer Morningstar is like really one of the second most powerful beings just underneath the creator. Yeah. And so, like, he's always a little worried, especially being in hell. Yeah. But, like, right now, he's kind of a guest. Right. So he's okay, but he's still like, I don't know how this is going to go. Do we go. get to meet Lucifer in this? Oh, yeah, we do. Okay. <laughs> we also go past a cage or a specific cell, and this cell is important because it'll end up coming up later on, and it has this woman named Nada in it who is Dream's, like, she says that he's his love, and he presents himself in another way. Mm. Because people who look upon Dream see him in specific ways, right. depending on their culture, essentially. Yeah. And that whole story will come about later on, but she wants him to forgive him, and he will not, and he leaves. And, like, Etrigan took him this way very specifically. So that she would see him. It was so he would see her. Mm. So we meet Lucifer. So then uh, Tilda Swinton shows up. Yeah! She sure does. We also are introduced to the fact that there are, not only Lucifer's not the only reigning body right now, there was like something that happened down in hell. Oh. So now it's led by three individuals. So it's Lucifer, it's uh, Beelzebub, and it's Azazel. Those are all names for the devil. I know, but they're three different entities. One's of Lord of Flies, one's like this pine cone of death. <laughs> and, and the other one's Lucifer. The other one's almost pine cone of death. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, essentially they... Go before all the demons. They gather the million demons of hell. Ooh. And then, like, Lucifer's like, all right, which one is it? Right. Who's got your shit? Dream's like, fuck you. I don't know. So then he uses his sand, and he casts it out, and it creates a trail right to the demon who has oh, cool. it. Who looks like some, like, reject, like... Real Ghostbusters villain? Yeah. And he has it, and he's just like, hey, listen, a mortal trade him at the, that thing to be fair and square for, like, some garbage amulet. Uh-huh. Because that's... <gasps> that's him. I, you're gonna fight me. <laughs> And so Dream's like, this could go really bad, but I have to accept. Yeah, all right, I'm in. I can't fight. Oh, no. They're not, I'm going to get my ass They're not going to have a fight. It's a, it's a, it's a fight that's a game. Uh, they're gonna play, oh, thank God. It's not like a dance-off. They're going to play reality, which um, looks really different in that compared to this. I mean, incredibly different. Is it better? Uh, depends on your take on it. Depends on what you like from it. But, um, so they play reality. They what play is reality? reality. Um, Okay, I never really saw this movie, but I know it's in the Sword in the Stone. Remember when, like, the two magic creatures go up against one another and yes. turn themselves into things? Yeah. They have to one-up each other. Okay. Yeah. And it becomes a germ that infects... Yes. Uh-huh. That's and that cool. happens at one point, actually. So, like, uh, his name... I can... I never say his name correctly, but it's Charonzon. <laughs> Uh-huh. starts and like he's like I'm a wolf and Morpheus is like I'm a hunter because there's a lot of ways you can lose whether you're like you're not imaginative enough you don't have enough conviction like, yeah. you, like you know what I mean you don't actually right. come up with something you gotta come up with some way of yeah, exactly the so like, they go back and forth and inevitably like um, Dream is a, a, a buffalo and so then he becomes anthrax okay. which is a bacteria and yeah. eats him and then like they go on from there and the final thing that happens is that um, Dream's like I'm gonna move away from this I'm gonna become like a, like a, like a, a universe essentially right 
Mm-hmm. Um, or he's like the world, and then he and then he goes like, I'm a nova, all exploding, and then he's like, well, I'm a universe, and then he goes, well, I'm anti life. Oh. And then Dream finishes with, and I'm hope. And Sharonzan's like, eh, I can't do what? hope. I got nothing. So then he loses. Dream's given the helm. The twins, Agony and Ecstasy, show up and they take him away to be tormented because he failed. <laughs> and in this, and in doing so, he tries to. He's like, Ah, come on, guys! Ah. Well, oh, well, this is them's the breaks when so you're in hell. Like, he's <laughs> got, <laughs> so he's got the helmet. He's gonna leave hell, and like Loser's like, Yeah, but why would I let you go? We have all these demons here. We could just take you down. Yeah. He's like, You're not powerful here. What's the, what is the power of dream? Ooh. And he goes, What is the power of dream? What good is any of your torture if your people do not dream of going to heaven? Right. And the, the seas part, and they just let him leave. <laughs> Get the fuck out. <laughs> and then Lucifer's like, I'm going to take you down one of these days. Mm-hmm. And that will come up again. Yeah. Ooh. We will return to Lucifer, but not here. But not now. Do and, we return to the pine cone? No, the, well, eventually, <laughs> but... This is, yeah. It's my favorite demon, the pine cone demon. Um, show back. The next part we're going to get to is like... amulet now? Su- yeah, but it's like super dark. Like, everything was dark. This <laughs> is, Wait, now, we're now, now it's getting dark. dark? Now it's... We just went to hell, but now we're going to get dark. We saw that woman consumed by dreams and her father was a living wall... And now we're getting dark. We Let's also get... saw a woman who was permanently asleep get raped, have a child, have that child taken away, and her remember that she had a child. Yes. But now we're going to get dark. Let's get nuts. Here we go. <laughs> so earlier, there was a scene where this woman by the name of Ethel Cripps, or Ethel D., who is the mistress of Roderick Burgess, yes. arrives at Arkham Asylum. Yay! Where she wishes to visit her son, Dr. Destiny. Oh, shit. Dr. Destiny dabbles in dreams. Dr. Destiny had a ruby for a while, which is an impossible name to pronounce, which I will attempt later on, but not at this <laughs> moment. And he uses that at one point to like, he does all kinds of things. Skullface, right? Yes, yeah, Skullface guy. And never, like at one point, I think pre-crisis, like, like impersonates Green Lantern, but mm-hmm. then later on, like, I think um, uses the name to, to cause all kinds of dream issues. And then like Batman and Green Lantern end up taking him down. Yeah. Um, but huh. now he's here, and the amulet went to the Justice League, or the, the Dreamstone. Right. Mom shows up to give him the amulet that she had, like the protective amulet. But because, she has, oh, she has the, the, yeah, the, the yeah. amulet that can't let them get hurt by. Right, because she dies, inevitably, and mm-hmm. like, she just dies. But that's who we're going to deal with now. So we go to Arkham Asylum, where cool. we see uh, Dr. Destiny, or, or, or D, as he likes to call himself at times, mm-hmm escaping where he runs of course into the scarecrow who's pulling a little prank where he's pretending that he hung himself and he's just like yeah but there's more to my prank for some reason he also looks like egon spengler yeah he does like they have this little like back and forth about how he's just like yeah you're gonna go but like everybody always comes back to arkham yes and like he's like no i gotta go because my mom died but i want to get my stone so i'll see you later bye he's also terrified yeah yeah he is a mummy yeah, there's at one point like what if he's his going teeth, to see his mummy? I think one of his teeth falls out. He's just like, oh, oh, it's gross. like, yeah, he's like, uh, yeah. I can't even interfere in my own hygiene. Exactly. Whoa. You want to talk about that now? What's great goodness doing here? Okay, so while we go on this Doctor Destiny journey, which is really him escaping, essentially like using a gun on a woman to get in her car, convincing her to drive him to where he needs to go because he knows where his dreamstone is. He yes. figures it out. He knows it's in, like this warehouse. He has to get there. Um, by warehouse, it's like in this place, like in like uh, it's like Mayhew, New York, or something like that. It's like some like, like facility where like the Justice League is storing a bunch of stuff oh, after cool. the destruction of the satellite. Okay, cool. So they got stuff there. He's gonna go there. He holds up this woman. She like is like trying to be like, oh my, my husband's like a mobster and he's gonna get you and stuff like that. Like, I don't she, give a shit. She kind of realizes he's like there's something wrong with him. She's like, did you just get out of prison? And he's like Arkham. She's like, oh god. Oh great. But they have like a lot of conversation, and she's just like, do you do you have like AIDS? Cause like he's like she doesn't get it because like remember that's like kind of big at the time so she yeah. assumes that he's messed up because of that. Well, there's a lot of like misconceptions about what the exactly, was. and she's just like and like he's like no, but like there's other no, stuff. No, I'm just going. gross. Yeah, and like inevitably he does bring or she brings him there and she's just like and she gives him like her husband's coat in the back because he has no clothes. Right. And he's like, hey, were you like lying before about like your husband being a mobster? And she's like, yeah, I was. And he's just like, well, you know, it really wouldn't have mattered anyway. And he blows her brains out. Right. But he wants his dreamstone back because it's his because he altered it. Oh. He changed it into that thing. That thing technically existed before this book did, and then you know, Gaiman used that. And made it into and, one of the yeah. totems of the Sandman. While this is Jesus. going on, the um, Sandman realizes he's like, he's like I, in the visions from those those girls, he showed them Batman and, and Green Lantern. Yes. So he goes to the Justice League, 
And the only person who is asleep is Scott Free. And in oh, his dreams, and in his dreams, he dreams of apocalypse and of granny goodness and of the horrors there. Okay. And then like dream like rescues him and takes him away. And he's just sitting on his bed like, hey. Yeah, hey. I was hey, here the whole time. I need you to give me my dreamstone back. He's like, what? I don't know what that is. He's like, I need my ruby. So then like he starts looking for it and like Scott Free's very much like, I can't, what is this? Is this what it is so, to be part of the Justice League? Because yeah, this sucks. Yeah, having ghost men come <laughs> and request their jewelry back. So he looks it up and he's like, oh, it looks like Dr. Destiny had it. And, I, and like, I don't know where it had it. was in the satellite. That exploded. So I don't know. So it must be in our warehouse. We're going to have to go talk to someone else. And he's just like, and he's going through the roster of who would have been around there. He's like, oh, Batman's working. All right. Uh, you know what? I got it. So they go off to find the Martian Manhunter. And when John opens the door, he sees that, which is Lord Zoril, oh. who is the dream god of the Martian. So he's just like, hey, I, I, yeah, whatever you need, man. Right. So they said they put it in storage and he wanted to like display it places. And he tells them where it is. Um, it's in upstate Gotham. Okay. Um, upstate Gotham. And, it's just in the storage unit. <laughs> and, then, yeah. and then they adorably, after like Dream leaves... Uh, like he's like who was that Scott Free's like I don't, I don't get it he's like it's an old god but you know what? let's talk about it over some Oreos I have stashed away <laughs> <laughs> or maybe some Chaco oh yeah but at the time they could say Oreos for this but yeah um, so then Dream ends up finding the, the Dreamstone first and he's like oh. awesome he gr- goes to grab it and like in doing so has it has a volatile reaction to him and it like sucks in a bunch of his power oh. because Dr. Destiny messed, messed with, with it, it. Yeah, and so like he I guess is booby trapped it. Kind of, it's just that it's it's altered. It's not right, uh, and so like he's knocked out. And Doctor Destiny shows up, and he's just like, "Oh, someone else tried to steal it. Oh, but you feel more powerful. Okay, cool, bye." Mm-hmm. And so then he leaves with the stone. And then this issue happens, and this issue is just like a, oh, oh my god, it is twenty four hours in a diner. Okay, where Doctor Destiny shows up, and we learn all about these characters. We learn about Betty. The, um, the, 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 the waitress there and how she's a writer and how she like collects stories from the people who come into the diner right. um, and she gives them happy endings and like someday she's going to mail them all into this place and be published and all and that she stuff. She finishes the stories for them. Oh. She doesn't jerk them off after their meal is over. That's only what they do at Denny's. I'm sure this is a different <laughs> diner. <laughs> um, and That's then we, those tables are so sticky. We meet Judy um, who is, was in a relationship with a, another young lady and like her like the the other young lady's mother didn't approve of it and they were supposed to meet up and the girl never shows up so she assumes that like all kinds of things are happening like she's like oh she's never gonna show up her mom convinced her not to go or like sent her off or whatever she just becomes more and more upset about this she will make a phone call to a character we will meet later in another volume jesus but like there's a flashback over the other no the other character like casually mentions it i was like yeah what steep cut yeah exactly we meet a young man who's on his way to a job interview. We meet a couple who, like, are really happy together, even though he kind of married her for her money. But, like, it turns out they really do love each other in the oh, end. Nice. And then we meet a trucker who Betty and, and he have been having a couple of roles in the hay occasionally. Oh. Um, even when he was married. Um. Um, it's fine. They, they, she's gone now. Right. Um, and Why Do-, do I imagine we're going to take a hard left turn? Well, Dr. This- Destiny is here. Yes. And um, Dr. Destiny won't let them leave. And each time they attempt to leave, he keeps them there. And we just see the hours tick on. And inevitably, he starts using his powers more and more. And, and he starts affecting them. And, and initially, he gives them these dreams in which they get the things they want. We get to see kind of good, bad, terrible people. What kind of people are they, mm-hmm. right? Then we see them all, like, fighting each other. He convinces them to do that. He wants them to, to amuse them. Then they want him... He wants them to love them. And in doing so, we see them, like, cutting their fingers off and feeding them to him. Mm -hmm. And then, like, they all watch TV for a little bit. And then he really gets to know them for a little bit. Like, he wants to know all of their secrets. He wants to know everything about them. By hour 13, he has them have an entire orgy on the floor just for his amusement. Right. By hour 14, he decides that the three women should be his own fates and give him his own, like, information and such. By the next hour, he ends up giving them back their sanity. So they all and remember, they remember and know what's everything happening. Everything that happened. By hour 16, he turns the dark, uh, the lights off and, and people start to murder one another. By hour 17, they punish one another. By hour 18, he turns them into beasts. By hour 19, he blinds a few of them and, and causes others pain. By hour 20, if they haven't killed themselves, they've killed one another. By hour 23, he hangs out, and 24, Morpheus shows up. Right. The read on this is unbelievable, because it is so, like, insane. Yeah. And just, like, every minute you're like, where the hell is Dream? Yeah. Why is he not here? When will he not show up? I'm sorry, I thought I was reading a book about Sandman 
What the fuck? <laughs> later, like, trust me, there will be weirder things later on. Like, in Volume 2, we go to a... I'm sorry, weirder things? In Volume 2, we go to a serial killer convention. Where they all meet, because they decide, like, hey, we all really love each other's work. So, like, we should, like, discuss and, like, compare notes and talk about, like what we do. Mm -hmm. I do not want to be the concierge <laughs> for that meeting. At that Holiday Inn. So then, like, essentially, like, we're gonna fight. But, like, as, like, that's gonna happen, like, the world's kind of starting to descend into madness because, like, he's using this power yeah. on a broader scope. And that's kind of his plan is to watch the world burn and to dance in its ashes. Right. Dr. Destiny's. Yes, okay. exactly. And Morpheus is like, he tries really hard, he sits down with him, and he's just like, hey. Stop. Yeah, pretty much. By the way, do you also, notice... what the fuck did you do to my image? Do you notice the art shift? Yes. This is the shift where Sam Keith left. And so, like, now we have this. It's better. It's better. Especially when it's less comical in here. Yeah. 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 Yeah, this is the time to not have Sam Keith's Right? So, brand. Morpheus tries to, he's like, listen, man, like, that's my ruby. Like, I made that out of part of myself and my essence, and, like, that's part of me. So, like, just give it back to me. Right, and Dr. Hess is like, no. He's like, oh, cool, you're in there, that's me, but I'm gonna kill you. Right. So then, like, essentially, Dream's like, all right, you want to fight? Even though I'm really weak, we're going to do it in the dream world. So he enters into the dreaming, and he follows because he can't help himself because he's a lunatic, and Dream immediately gets him. And, like, he puts him into this role of, like, this, like, Caesar-esque, like, position okay. and gets him going there for a little bit. And then, like, he starts to realize, wait, no, 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 no. I'm Dr. Destiny. Okay, hang on. No, no, he's just, he's tricking me. So then he's searching for Morpheus. He's trying to find him. He's got to get him. And then finally he kind of like seemingly gets the upper hand. He starts to sort of like wreck some of the dreaming. He starts like pulling in like other people's dreams and such. And then he's just like, you know what? Wait, I know what I'll do. You want this back? This is part of you. I want you dead. I'm going to break this thing and it'll kill you. Oh. And when he breaks it. I remember this. There's like a void. And, and all of a sudden he's just like, cool. Now I'm dream. Neat. I did it. Oh. Good for me. But he's not because what he did was he released all of dream's power back into him. Wow. <sighs> And so he doesn't need the amulet because he is the amulet. Well, yeah, because all the power to come back into him. And he's yeah. like, oh, cool. Hey, thank you for that. Remember what happened with Alex Burgess? Remember he's like in the waking nightmare? Yes. Yeah, wouldn't you assume something as horrific would happen? I would. No. No. He just He's just like, yeah, you know what? Like, they have a conversation about like him and stuff like that. And he's like, I'm just going to take you back to Arkham. He killed all of those people. Yeah. And Dream takes him back to Arkham. Right. Now, that could be interpreted a couple of ways. It could be he feels guilty because it's really his fault because it was his power. Yeah, he shouldn't have had that in the first place. Um, It could also be that Morpheus is kind of in this weird place where he's just like, yeah, but it didn't really affect me. Right. I, Here's like, the thing. I was trapped for 70 <laughs> years, so screw that guy. I didn't get to eat anything. You <laughs> you inconvenienced exactly. me for a day or two. I yeah. assume that it's because like dreams are impartial. Right. That like they only get involved when they need to do their duty or if they are slighted. Except the end, like some of the, it depends on some of the ends. Some of the ends are a little more involved. Yeah, dream seems to be, or death seems a little more death sympathetic. Is, desire can be, um, what's interesting about desire is desire is neither male nor female. It appears as it pleases. Right. Except for it is desire is all things. Yes. Um, the next issue, the final issue in this book is called A Death in the Family. Really? Oh! <laughs> 1989, yeah. Oh, wait. It's literally a death in, in the, the family. Yeah. This is an incredible issue. Like, we just literally had, like, this shit show. Yeah. Right? It's a shit show. And then this issue comes along, and Morpheus is feeding the birds. In yeah. Washington Square Park. And he's feeling kind of depressed. Oh, is he? That poor guy. And Death shows up, and she's like... And she is the most relatable character that you'll experience. Wait, is that a good thing? Yes. Death is incredibly down to earth. Death deals with people more than anyone else probably does. Death every century makes herself mortal and allows herself to go through death to understand what it is she is doing. Yeah, to death ground is, her, really. Death is up on the times. Death makes a Mary Poppins reference in this. <laughs> she talks about, like, the Oh, yeah, it's a nice timely reference. And, like, Dick Van Dyke. But, like, she, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, she's she from the era. She experiences pop culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, like, she has a really sunny disposition. Because, as we find right. out later on, because I, I feel like I should explain this to you, when they, when they talk about death later on, they kind of give a description of her. Because none of the endless would call her death. They just call her sister. Mm. Because a lot, most people, apparently us, forget that we see death twice. We see her at the beginning of our lives and at the end, but we only remember the end. And Ooh. so they feel it's unfair to call her that. Right. Okay. So, like, it's kind of cool, right? Okay. So they have this whole conversation about how he's just like, yeah, well, I thought I wanted revenge, and I got revenge, and now I'm just like, mm -hmm. Wasn't as good as I thought it was going to exactly. be. Now I have all my stuff, and I don't know what to do. How yeah. about you do your job? <laughs> <laughs> Did you 
He'd be less of a dick. He's just like, he just doesn't know like what to do with himself, essentially, right? And she's just like, hey, just out of curiosity, like, how come you never, like, asked for help or, like, called me? Because nobody knew where he was, presumably because of the magic dome. Yeah. And if he just called out, she could have come. Someone might come and get her. Yeah. yeah her he's name. just like, I don't want to worry you. And she's just like, oh my god. Yeah. And then she rips into him, like... Like, only an older sister could. Yeah. She just dresses him down about how he's self-centered and arrogant and a jerk and how everybody's worried about him and how could he do that? And he's just like, well, I just didn't think. And she's like, no, no shit you didn't think. Right. You, you idiot. If and you excuse me, I have to go let's kill this person over here. Well, she's <laughs> like, ah! well, no, she's actually like, I gotta go do my work. You wanna come with me or what? And so they walk the earth and he gets to see her doing her work. And you get all these like really like interesting kind of sad stories, but yeah. some of them aren't. Where like death visits them and has a little conversation with some people, um, just about the end and how everyone always recognizes when death is there. Yes, that kind of thing. Um, and like this one's sad as a comedian. She's like, oh, I really like. She dies just like right before her career might have started. Okay, like the uh, the mic electrocutes her, oh. and she's just like, oh, I've only had a few more years. Um, we see her, but it's really funny, right? <laughs> well, kind of. We she died on stage. We see her like take a baby. Yes. Um, which is incredibly sad because, like, you see the aftermath of the mother finding it. Yeah. But, like, the baby, like, actually is able to speak when, right. after it's dead. And he, he goes, like, oh, that's it? That's all I get? And she's like, sorry, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, like, come on, let's go. But, like, each time it happens, like, Dream hears the flutter of wings. Because, like, that's, like, the sign of, like, the passing on, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, they go all over the place. They see all kinds of death. And, like, as he walks with her, like, he starts to, like, not only understand humanity, but, like, what it is that she does and what her responsibilities are and that he's like been like a real shithead and needs to get back <laughs> to doing what he needs to do, yeah. right? And the final death is actually the kid they met first with the soccer ball. He gets hit by a car mm -hmm. and like she takes him and like it's funny because he hit on her and everything like yeah. that. And she's just like, hey, you, you, gotta go, you have to see something. It's like his body and stuff like that. But because of this, Dream is reinvigorated to go on and to recreate the dreaming and to like get going again. Like he's ready to, to be the thing he's supposed to be. Right. To be dream of the endless, right? And this book ends like this because this is eight issues. This is eight issue volume. That used to be what they collected, right? And it was usually around, around eight issues that people would get a call that said your series is canceled because DC tried to keep things around for at least a year because otherwise it made them look bad. Yeah. So he assumed around this time the book would be canceled. So he really only worked through like eight stories. Mm -hmm. And so this book ends like it's like, well, that, we never never see this again. Right. Like, well, that was fun, but uh, Neil Gaiman will find another assignment. Hilariously, the very first issue sold really, really well. And then mm -hmm. they saw a steep decline. And then around issue five, it just kept going up and up. So the point where I was at selling its contemporaries like Swamp Thing and Hellblazer. And mm -hmm. they were like, this train's not stopping. Yeah. And so they just kept going. It was also in this time where like they were celebrating this type of, of work. Yeah. V Vertigo was birthed from this. Yes. It was and, birthed from the idea of some of these books. And, and so suddenly this audience that didn't exist or mm -hmm. didn't exist emerged. Yes. Because there was a vacuum. Right. And, and here's another thing that's interesting. And like, I, I have nothing, I have no actual stats. It's just like something um, that Gaiman has said in interviews. So I, you'll have to talk to him about his statistics on this. Hmm. By the time this is ending, around issue 75, um, or at issue 75 in 1996, um, the market's kind of collapsed. When? What year is 96. that? 96. Yep. So like the collector's market is tanking, right? Mm -hmm. This book like sandman he says was outselling books similar to batman at that point yeah because people weren't buying to collect it they were buying to read it yep and in fact they, they were also historians claim that sandman is one of those books that did the thing that comic book companies desperately want to do and they brought in new readers yeah college kids were finding this book who had never read a comic before exactly that's what vertigo trade. was and they were like what is this yeah. And they were on board and they grew a fan base from that. Mm -hmm. So like this like concept is like, like lightning in a bottle. Yeah. And like the fact that everything fell into place the way it did, the fact that it was so random, the fact that like from the Comics Code Authority, this was pushed into this imprint, the fact that like the collector's market crashed, but this was totally fine. And the fact that at the end of the day, they respected his wishes and ended the series when he left yeah. is unbelievable. Yeah, it, it's... It's unprecedented, and it's never been it's never been equaled. No, no, but it is one of those reads that like there's a lot to it, and like if you're someone who analyzes, this is going to be great. If you're someone who doesn't, 
that's and just enjoys the story. Yeah, because he's if nothing else, he is a a a world builder. Like he, that's what he does. And like while yes, there are horror elements, and in the next volume that follows, there definitely are. There are also these fantasy elements too. And like this is truly like that kind of dark fantasy. Mm-hmm. Um, where, like, he inevitably deals with things like William Shakespeare and, like, Oberon and Titania, and, like, you'll see all these crazy things. And, like, while, yes, we will randomly just deal with humanity and Dream will be, like, a side character, there is definitely an overarching tale for Morpheus and Dream, and you see him grow and change. And by the end, it's... Well, you'll have to just read it and find out what happens at the end of this. Well, there you go. (laughs) This was fun! I didn't expect, like... (laughs) This to be, as... to be as fun. I was expecting <laughs> something that was like Heavy. mystical and like deep and like freaking dark. And while dark, I didn't expect to enjoy myself as much as I did. <laughs> well, that is awesome. I'm telling you, it's a great read. And again, it doesn't matter. Get this one. Find this one. Whatever you like. Pick up the hardbound. If you like the annotated version, I have the second volume of the annotated version, which I had a good time with. Some people like it. Some people don't. It has like... Facts about Neil Gaiman, it also just, like, will let you know about some references that are made if you don't necessarily, like, necessarily understand what they are. It'll be there. Um, or, like, even just, like, some Latin words. In the volume I have, it actually is the Dream Library. And so they go through all the titles of books that are oh, cool. not ever created, and they explain to you why it's important. Nice. And I was like, that's awesome. So that That's was really fun, really fun and very cool. Uh, again, it's one of those things, I, I don't think you'll regret reading it. Um, it it's, not, it's not a standard comic. But no, it's but, it, a, it's a, but it is in a way. It is. Yeah. It really is. It should be. It's yes. No, it absolutely should be. Um, but yeah. So not only that, but I think we do. It, we actually. All right. So these are all. These were sent by fans. Yeah. And I, thank you guys so much because honestly, I loved having the color, like the difference. Difference because definitely like also if you're studying color theory, try to get a hold of both of these because hmm. trust me, the panels in hell. I think in particular totally different read you'll have definitely a different emotional reaction to them just because of the color but we also have a third copy of this and i think we should give it away oh all right. i would love to put this in the hands of someone who has never read sandman before in the comment you must uh, identify yourself as i've never read sandman before um and maybe some in in some way say like i didn't have any interest in reading it but now all of a sudden i would like to see what's all yeah about. give me your reason as to why you want to read sandman yeah what about the episode made you go oh, okay i've got to pick this up now right and we'll uh, we'll decide i'll have uh, tiffany really read through them and decide hey, which maybe one. we should make a hashtag okay yeah Can we hashtag it yeah okay let's do it hashtag yeah. send me sandman okay yeah use that in your comments so <laughs> Give us your qualifier and then put hashtag send me Sandman. We'll put it in the uh, video as well so and, you can search for it. And once we um, announce a winner um, in the future, we will uh, get your information and then send it off to you. Because again, I, I I feel like this book needs to be in more hands. It is a it, If you've read Watchmen and you haven't read Sandman, what are you doing? Uh, being <laughs> an idiot, I guess. Yeah, making a show about comics on this book. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to check the description box for a whole lot of more awesome things. And give us a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And we'll see you guys next time. I'm Tiffany. I'm Sal. I'm reading. Oh, he's gonna, and that's Ben over there. And he's going to read Sandman because otherwise he's a jerk. Yeah, that's right. Bye. Wait, what?